Can I tell you, remember what we started with, what we started the conversation with is we said, hey, um, what if I can't qualify? And what if somebody tries to charge me 6.75% interest? What if somebody tries to charge me 8% interest to sell our finance? How dare them? Okay. Okay. And then remember how we said, stop, 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 stop. As long as we're making more than the mortgage and we have adults paying off homes for us gladly and happily, and they're grateful to you for the opportunity to pay your houses off for you, who cares what you're paying in interest? It, it, you know, right now you may need to borrow money from a person to get started and pay more interest, but y'all, you still have Remember, that is not the point. The point is we are getting people in houses to start paying them off for us. So let's talk about this, Tim and others who are saying, how do I qualify? Okay, um, most of the time, if you're going to get, um, if you're going to get money from a, a person, and, and I'm calling it hard money. I hate calling it that because that makes it sound like Uncle Guido. He's going to break your leg if you don't pay. But people usually want you to put more money down. And I had a question after the last class and somebody um, sent me a message and she said, she goes, well, I love the house that I'm in and I don't want to move, it, you know, and so I don't know how to get in. And so that's why I, I put a whole section in here about plan B this time. Y'all, you can still get in. You're just going to pay more interest and have to put more down if you're not moving. Um, let's talk about using your home equity. Um, we talked about it just briefly earlier, but let's say that you love your house and you do not want to move, but you still want to get in the game as um, plan B. Plan B means that you are going to use your home equity that you have. And when you take it out, that allows you to pay more money down and have a higher interest rate. But you, if, I mean, if you've got the money, then it, I can tell you right now, you're going to make a lot more doing what we're talking about than actually, than what you're making right now, if it's in the bank. And if you're in the stock market, I mean, you're, you've probably got notifications on your phone going off all the time because it's so up and down right now. And so just remember, I mean, what other investment can you have? that you are holding a deed. And if somebody start, stops paying, y'all, Georgia is a very landlord-friendly state. And it, I mean, it's very easy. I mean, not, look, can we just please take out the whole 2020 moratorium and just pretend that never happened? But, but just normally, normally it is very easy, you know, to, to get people in and out. And we're gonna go over some landlord strategies at the end to hopefully make you feel comfortable about moving forward. But, you know, if you don't want to sell your house, then don't. But it does not mean <laughs> that you that not to get a, a home equity line of credit. The thing is, why wouldn't you want to hold the money? They're not going to give it to you. And y'all, you don't have to pay interest on the money if you're not using it. Okay. It's a checkbook that it's that you can just have an advance and then you can pay it back. There's a lot of people that are using the home equity line of credit to like pay off one of their investment properties or to flip a house, like we talk about in class one of this series about flipping houses and being investor A, you know, who's just buying it, fixing it up and selling it. But the home equity line of credit is a, is a great way to get in the game without having to sell your house. Think about your primary residence loan and the investment loan. Remember the investment loan, you know, the difference is the interest rate and the down payment. The bottom line, investor interest rate and down payment required investors for, to get an investor loan, 10 to 20% down. And, you know, you may be paying 1%-ish more in interest, you know, because investor loans, even putting down 20%, it's never going to be what primary residence loans are. And Okay, and so so listen, I'm, we're going to change topics for a minute and go to to LLC or not to LLC. That is the question. This is a short conversation, but I just wanted to address it because we've talked about it before, just as an overview. And I said I would get to it in this class. So, if a property has a mortgage, okay, then the lender has what is called a due on sale clause. 
Okay, the due on sale clause can be activated for different things by the lender. One of those things is if the property changes ownership without the mortgage company permission. Okay, so let's just say that, um, we'll just say that Michelle, you know, is getting a loan, okay? And if she goes ahead and gets a loan and she says, oh, hey, I'm going to quit claim that into an LLC. Y'all, does everybody know what LLC stands for? Limited Liability Company. So basically, you're getting, you're putting the property into an LLC to protect yourself from liability, okay? Does the mortgage company have a mortgage with that LLC? No, they do not. <laughs> they have your social and you are responsible. And one of the things that activates or, or one, of the, one of the reasons that a mortgage company can legitimately activate a due on sale clause is if you change the ownership without their written permission. And so if you own the property in cash or you pay it off, so it's debt free, then 100% put it into an LLC. If you are holding mortgages for people because you're on that side of the spectrum um, and you're holding mortgages for people, then just remember that you can only hold three um, without getting a mortgage broker's license if you're gonna hold conforming loans. So a way that you can hold mortgages for other people is to have them put it into an LLC their loan, and then back it up personally. Okay, so so for those of you who want to loan people money, I've talked to several of you after, after these investor classes start. It's a great opportunity to get 8% right out of the gate. And just say you'll loan people money if they're going to put 20 or 30% down on the house to be sure you've got plenty of equity in the case of a downturn. Or if they stop paying on it, then you will just take it back and resell it to somebody else. So once you start buying places and you start paying them off where you, or you're getting a loan from an individual who wants you to have it in an LLC because it's good for both of you um, because they're not a conforming loan institution, then what we want to do is we want to have separate LLCs to limit liability claims to individual properties. So if you have five rental houses, or we'll just stick to our first example of three. If you have three rental homes, and let's just say for a moment, five years from now, you hit it big on one, you um, either got a home equity line or sold sold that one to take the, the money out, you paid off the other two and bought another one, and now you have three debt-free properties, okay? And I just want to say for the record, if you can't see yourself doing that, then I want you to just take a minute and breathe in that is a reality that can very easily happen. I bought a house one time in, in gosh, what was it? Around 1997-ish. Yeah, I bought it for 110,000 and sold it for 330, like six years later. It can happen, you know? I mean, just and, and you just have to, I mean, y'all, we, we are in the real estate business. We see how fast houses are going up right now. And can I tell you the houses which are appreciating faster than any other house is the houses which cost the very least. Because, I mean, those are the ones that are starter homes. You know, the folks who are graduating from college, getting married, you know, having a baby, moving up, moving down, empty nesters. You know, everyone would like to have a house for 200, 250, 300, 350. And so really the question is, is just who's going to get it. And so when we are um, to set up an LLC only takes 15 minutes. I put just the print screens of how to do that so that you can see all you have to do is go to um, Secretary of State, which is what SOS stands for, sos.georgia.gov. You will see um, that, that home screen. Oh, uh, uh, look, y'all. You know how frugal I am right now. I always want to pass the savings along. So um, do do skip the name reservation and do not pay. Do not pay the $25 or 50 or whatever it is right now. 
you can search the business. You can search the business name that is your um, first name choice if you're setting up an LLC. And then if when you search the business, don't write the whole name out. Like if you wanted to be Catalina Property, okay, then just put in Catalina space PR, okay, just so that you can be sure that nobody has your name. Well, when you search, you see, uh-oh, Catalina Properties is already in there. You, you see what I mean? And so, so you're going to have to pick something else. So maybe you want to say, okay, well, I'm, I'll use my first and last name, Catalina Smith Properties. So then when I put in Catalina Smith, look, there's no, there's nothing that matches it, meaning that I do not need to wait the two to three days to get the name reservation acknowledged. Um, I do not need to put my credit card in to pay for a name reservation. I just looked up my own name and I see that Catalina Smith Properties is going to be the new LLC name if that's what I want it to be. So I, so I, I come back to, to the business page and say, create a domestic entity. And then that's all you're doing is registering an, an LLC. It's going to ask you some questions in there. Super easy questions that you'll know the answer to. Um, it's, as soon as you finish with this, then you want to go to um, irs.gov so that you can. Oh, and, and I, I did want to just mention this. This is on the Georgia Secretary of State page. And y'all, it's got so much great information. And so does irs.gov, by the way. It's so easy to read. And it's not just because I'm nerdy, even though I am nerdy. It is, it's really, they just make it very easy to read now. You know, it's no longer that you need to be a, a CPA, you know, to understand. And I would just encourage you, don't forget to create a tax ID for your LLC if you're going to set one up. Just because, there, you know, if you set up, an LLC, the only reason you're doing it is to um, limit liability. And if you're still using your social security number, then you're not limiting your liability. So um, when you do create a tax ID at irs.gov, you'll just say, um, put in the search bar, just put in um, apply online and then EIN, which is employer um, employment identification number but you'll see it. I mean, it's super easy and it shoots right back to you. Like as soon as you push send to, to um, ask for the tax ID, it pops it right back and says, hey, do you want to open your PDF of your new tax ID number? So y'all, I think I'm going to be candid and this is another class, so I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole, but I do want to say, y'all, we should all have a, 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 an LLC, okay? I mean, just with, with all of the crazy going on in the world today and the hacking and the you know, identity theft and everything. It's just, I mean, using our social, it, when it's not 100% necessary, it's just not a good idea. When you don't have your three rental properties or your 10 rental properties in different LLCs, then the, the tenant in one house, by the way, not just the tenant, also, if you have a car accident and it's your fault, you know, and there's anything, you know, if you were tired or whatever, if, you know, somebody was saying that, um, that if they were pursuing you, you know, like by calling one of the, the late night TV lawyers, you know, <laughs> they'll say, oh, we're going to take Jill to the cleaners because she's got five rental houses and they're all in the same LLC. And so, boom. So, Y'all, you know what I've never done in a class, but it blew my mind and I was so excited about doing it right now with y'all for the first time ever, the virgin voyage of all this information put together is so usually I'll slice it up because there's so many benefits of investing. Like one is the appreciation of the house, you know, just the fact that like that house that I'm about to close on is, um, I, I mean, I could resell that next week if I wanted to, but I don't want to because there's no rental restrictions. <laughs> so, so, um, but here, and I'm not going to put any money in it except the money I'm paying for it. So here's the thing though, y'all, if you don't know about depreciation and if friends and family are on this class because y'all invited them, y'all, if you do not have a real estate license and you're on this class, I would just encourage you to either get one or marry somebody with one so you can capitalize 
on all of this. Hey, hey, and single ladies out there, you can always put this on your profile that you have a real estate license, okay? Because the rich people they need the the they need the, a real estate agent to be able to write off depreciation for their investment property. So I would definitely add that on. So there is, um, so here's the thing about depreciation. What we're going to do, though, that I've never done, which I'm, I, you're not even going to believe the number. I mean, I, I just I just kept doing it on a calculator because it's so unbelievable. But OK, so if you are buying if at the first part of the class, we said if you're buying three houses for three hundred thousand dollars each. OK, there's one benefit of the house, which is if your mortgage payment, remember, was seventeen hundred and you only put twenty two hundred dollars in when we looked at all the ways to to minimize how much you had to put in to buy these three houses okay it does not matter if you paid cash for it or you have a mortgage what we're going to talk about right now with depreciation is an entirely separate and additional money okay this has nothing to do with the overage between 1700 and 2500 that you are charging monthly for your house Yay you that you have that $700 a month. This is something separate in addition to that. So let's do it. The sales price. Okay, so depreciation. Um, remember how I was just saying that you need to get a real estate license to be sure that you can um, write this off. Y'all, if you have a real estate license, then of course you can. Okay. The thing is, if somebody has a W-2 job and they do not have a real estate license and they make a lot from their w-2 job but they don't show any income from their rental then there's a question on your tax returns that say did you spend this many hours and i think it's around 60 or something but i'm on this house this year okay well the thing is you know we can definitely say that we spent 60 hours in real estate because we are licensed but if you are not licensed, that's when you, you know, sometimes have to answer that question. Just throwing that out there for anyone without a license, all of us that are, um, you're welcome. This is unbelievable. So here we go. 300,000, the, the standard rate that the IRS um, gives you for depreciation that they assign to a property is 0.8. Okay, so it's 80% of the sales price. So this new place that I will be closing on next Tuesday I'm going to get to say 480 times 80%, okay? And then I get that total. And then I take that number, so 80% of the sales price, and I divide it by the same number every single time because it is the IRS number. It is not Michelle's number. It's not my opinion. It is 27.5 years. 27.5 years is the amount of time that the IRS has assigned to depreciate investment property, for residential investment property. For commercial, it's 39 years, but we we're talking about um, residential. So, so I just want you to walk down this road with me and open your mind. If you are paying attention to something else, it is not going to make you nearly as much as these next few slides. So just go with me for a minute. I know there's some numbers. Go back and watch it later. But y'all, this is what happens. <laughs> okay. I mean, this is, I mean, truly, it's just unbelievable. So if you have three rental properties, which is what we're starting with in our example and carrying it through the whole class, $300,000 sales price. So then look um, at the numbers that I put on the um, burgundy part of the screen, 300,000 sales price times 80% is $240,000 divided by 27.5. It's 87.27 y'all for each house. Now, when you hear 8727, you're just thinking, show me the money. <laughs> Where do I get my 8727? That is not what you're getting, okay? Remember, what you're getting in your hand is the $700 that you are charging $2,500 when your mortgage is $1,700. Let me show you the other way that people do not include in their return on investment, which is just dead wrong, which is why a lot of people are not getting into real estate when they real estate investing when they should be okay so are y'all ready how can this be real i mean okay so if you want to invest in real estate i want you to but even if you don't or if you're saying michelle i've got thirty thousand dollars of credit card debt i got behind i would i listen that 
do you do you understand that I don't care what your story is that there it is impossible that if you will work that you will not be able to sell enough houses one or two and pay it off and then jump in okay so what if you have to postpone jumping in for six months I know but you're still getting in okay has anybody just decided that they don't want recurring income where they make 10 or 20 or thousand dollars or more before they wake up every month no okay we're all still on board so go with me here let's say that you are a part-time real estate agent or let's say that you are an agent and your spouse is not either way let's say that you have either w-2 income or 1099 income of $100,000. So everybody's with me. And just notice what I'm doing. I'm isolating on the slide. I am isolating just depreciation. I know that you get to write off your, your mortgage interest for your house. I know that you get to write off for each child you have. I know that you, dudes, I know. I'm isolating this to show you that this is magic and it's beautiful and if you can tell other investors about that, you just found out how you're about to sell three, five, 10 houses to people. Because if you can explain what I'm talking about right now, then people are going to buy houses from you because it's ridiculous not to. So notice. So if you know anybody, okay, that if, if you're just trying to do this for someone else, or this is your personal situation, that makes $100,000, then your approximate tax, and let's say that you got to $100,000 after, after you've already written off your mortgage interest, you have already written off whatever you're going to write off, and you couldn't, and, and your income is $100,000. I can tell you who can see this very easily is anyone watching this that has, that gets W-2 income. Because if you get double, if, if, if you're getting W-2 income, and that's your primary source of income, then you can just look and see what was your federal and state tax rate, you know, and FICA. So when you look at it all, you can see I got 100, that's my gross, and then my W-2 or my current pay stub says that of 100, that between FICA, state, and federal, I had 35% taken from me. Some people pay 42. I just use 35 because it's a good number, Okay. Walk with me. If you have depreciation, remember that $8,727 that we talked about? You get to write that off for 27 and a half years every single year for every house that you have. So look what it does to your income. You see, when you got the $100,000, then you still had to pay $35,000 on your net income. You have $65,000 left after taxes. If you made the same $100,000 and you have three rental properties, and let's just say for a minute, like you said, Sabrina, like what if somebody wasn't paying or whatever? And what if I just broke even and I didn't get any rental income? I did not get $700. I, you know, I just broke even, okay, for the year. Like if there were some big supply issues or, you know, like, I mean, God bless the landlords, you know, that were doing this during the, the eviction moratorium. But, but regardless, we're isolating just what having these three rental income, these three rental properties do to your tax returns. So from the hundred, now you get to take away $26,181. So now you're only paying taxes on $73,819. So how much more did I get to keep? And, and, and so let's just say this for a minute. If you've got W-2 income, then chances are that $35,000 already came out of your check. Okay, so you're looking at federal, state, FICA. You're seeing it's already out. So you're saying, Michelle, you paid thirty five percent. Dude, they give it back to you. Okay, that's called a tax refund. That's what happens with depreciation. So instead of getting sixty five thousand dollars after taxes, you when you've got three rentals that are three hundred thousand dollars, this is going to be the amount, and you're going to then you're going to have seventy seven thousand dollars left after taxes. So 
y'all, we just did it on one. What if we had three $300,000 properties getting $700 a month each? We're already at $2,100 a month times 12 plus this 12,000, okay? So now is the time, I mean, seriously, y'all, I mean, we could have fainting, okay? I mean, just really, you might just want to get some water or a fan just in case, okay? <laughs> because it's coming right now. Now let's go to 10 rental properties, okay? 10, because do you know what I've, I am feeling in my spirit, I'm feeling in my spirit that no matter how much I talk about being a landlord, that someone out there still thinks, I just don't want to be one. And I want to get behind you and rally behind you and say, no one wants to be a landlord. What people want is the result of being a landlord. And that's why we're talking about how we have to do some things that we don't want to do. But at least, y'all, we have the opportunity to do it. And we're talking about how to get in the game where some people, they just look at people doing it on TV or read books and they say, wow, you know what? I could never do this. And there's no way to say that when we leave this class today. So we're going to go in. And so now let's say that you know that same person, whether it's you or someone else. And y'all, if you tell me that you don't know anybody to sell a house to, after leaving this information and learning about depreciation, then you need to call everyone that you know that has a job. If they have a job, then they need a rental home, okay? If they have W-2 income, and this is why. Y'all, we're so fortunate in being in real estate because we, you know, we can just have a windfall, you know, in, I mean, our income is just not so in a box where we just get paid every 15th and 30th we can have something huge happen. And the thing is, y'all, this is that huge thing for people that are stuck in that W-2 income cycle, you know, is, is real estate investing. And y'all, do you understand why this person? So while I do not know anyone personally out of all the landlords that I know that just love, you know, the thought of having 10 rental properties. Okay. And just like you said, Tim, Who's got time to do that? Well, let me show you why people have time, okay? The real estate job income, let's just go back to the 100,000. And remember, we're at 65,000. That part of the example is the same. But if we said that we had 10 instead of three rental houses, okay, and y'all, I think we would all agree that $100,000 is, is a good amount of money that we could all live on. I mean, that that's definitely not like scraping by. I mean, that's living comfortably and okay. But do you understand that right now, if I inconvenience myself and I buy 10 houses over the next two years, okay, that this could be me. So when I'm making the hundred thousand dollars, so I actually get it right. So I get the money from either the tenants, W-2 income, spouse, um, real estate, whatever. I just get $100,000 that I have nothing to write off against it. Do you see what happens right there? That instead of having $65,000 left, that I will have $98,000 left because of those 10 rentals, I'm still writing off that same $87,27 for 10 houses instead of only the three. So even though I'm over here living large because I made $100,000 last year, if you make 100, you're going to give $35,000 of it away. So you get to look and say 65,000 that you have left after taxes divided by 12 months in a year is how much you get in your hand monthly to spend on your expenses. If you had the 10 rentals for the next 27 and a half years, you will have $98,091 after your after you finish your taxes, as opposed to $65,000.